This video is sponsored by the following people. Please click the links in the description below. Those are the first pair of tongs I ever made. They're absolutely awful, except they're actually really good at loading things into the oven. So I thought I was being really clever back in the day, put this big old curve in the handle so that you could really spring down on them. Actually, this curve here just means you get blisters on the outside and the inside if you try and use them for forging, but they hold really well for loading the oven, so I've, I've not thrown them out yet. This is kind of cool actually as well. I don't, don't use this for, um, when I'm doing one knife at a time. This is a jig for hardening whole batches of hidden tangs at once. So you just use the weight of the knife to hold it in place. You can load about 10 onto that and then, oops, if they don't fall over, you can load them all into the oven at the same time. That's really quite handy. So that one will be in for 10 minutes and then it'll come out and sit in air for about 15 minutes to get really nice and cool to the core. And then we'll put it in for another 10 minutes to soak, to heat up, and then we'll quench it into oil. I can't remember if the cladding is 304 or 316, but it's one of the 300 series stainless, so that's a, a mild stainless, basically. And the core is ATCRV2, which is a fairly simple carbon steel, basically. Popular among blacksmiths because it's got a fairly low hardenability, so it doesn't air harden while you're forging it, for example. I do also like to make Sanmai with slightly more exotic cores. ATCR V2's got okay performance, but it's not anything to write home about, so I do them also with 26C3, which is a little bit more of a high quality steel. And then I'm also currently trying to learn to do all stainless Sanmai or semi stainless. So I've got a bar of A2 at the moment, which is the next one I want to try and make cores out of, which isn't fully stainless, but it is somewhat stain resistant. Should hold a really nice edge, but that's proving a little bit more tricky. Quite likes to come apart while you're forging because the A2 moves a lot slower than the cladding. The cladding shifts over and then the, the welds kind of just peel apart. I'm not sure whether that's gonna be a case of just forging it hotter or whether I need to get some harder cladding so that they travel at similar speeds, for example. I know it's a solvable problem though because a lot of bladesmiths use, for example, raw iron over quite a hard tool steel and raw iron moves way faster than tool steel so it's it's definitely a solvable problem it's just about finding the right balance just take a little peek in here right that's nearly up to temperature uh, no it heats up pretty quickly it should heat up within two or three minutes but then you let it sit at temperature for about seven minutes, five to seven minutes for basically some of the stuff that's in there that's not iron or carbon to dissolve. It takes a little bit of extra heat. So it's a little bit like ice in a glass, I guess. So if you pour water over it, it doesn't just dissolve immediately. It needs to sit for a little bit of time for the ice to actually fully dissolve. If it was a plainer steel, so just iron and carbon, you could just heat it up and cool it down straight away. But because this has got a little bit of chromium, a little bit of molybdenum in it, they take a little bit of time to dissolve, basically. I'll just get the oil ready. So this is some Rye 50 fast quench oil. Especially with Sanmai, you want the fastest quench you can get because you've got to get the coldness into the core. So that's gonna mean that it artificially cools slower than if it was a full thickness piece, kind of. So yeah, I like a fast quench oil and I would definitely recommend looking into the difference between a fast quench oil and a natural oil. If you are a bladesmith and you haven't, it's quite embarrassing. I was, I was quenching in, uh, in rapeseed oil for quite a while and the hardness difference is appreciable. So it's designed to basically imitate water down to about 400 degrees, but then water has a directly linear cooling rate, which is quite harsh on steel. So it goes very sharp down to 400, this oil this is, and then it, it 
like gets a lot slower cooling after that, which is a lot less harsh on the steel than doing a water quench. So this should give us the best of both worlds between the high hardness of a water quench and the lower probability of cracking or warping of an oil quench, basically. Right, so I'm just gonna have another check. Yep, that's up to temperature. I'm gonna clear my whole area first. I like to move quite fast when I'm quenching it. I wanna come from the heat into the oil as quickly as possible. If I can get it done in a quarter of a second, that would be ideal. Go under the oil, then I'm gonna move the knife backwards and forwards to keep fresh, cool oil uh, traveling over the blade the whole time. Otherwise you get a jacket of boiling oil or the vapor jacket. So you need to keep breaking the vapor jacket up. I'll hold it under for 12 to 15 seconds, pull it out. I'll also immediately, as I pull it out, I'll check if it's warped because you have a couple of seconds where it's not actually formed the hard crystals yet. You can bend it around a little bit and it's not gonna have any side effects to the knife. Yeah, I'll quench it 15 seconds, check it straight, and then leave it in a vise to cool down. Okay, so we're ready to go. I like to leave the door closed as much as possible. Nice and straight. Little bit of a tweak there. So I'll just hold it like this until it cools down. It's probably still gonna have a little bit of that bend that I'm unbending, but it'll be easier to get out afterwards. The crystals, the martensite doesn't finish reforming until it's actually below 50 degrees centigrade. So if I were to rub a file over that and do the file test right now, it would actually sound like it's semi-soft still. Uh, that's, that's already started to form. As I go, that will start to make a higher and higher resonancy as it gets harder. So at the minute, only about half of the half of the martensite has formed. Once this gets down to touchable temperature, it'll be harder again. Yep, that's pretty much ready to go. So I'll just put this next to the oven and we've got to wait quite a long time for the oven to cool down. What I like to do is turn the oven off and then I'll actually leave the knife on top of the oven and that'll keep the blade at about 45 degrees until it's ready to temper, which is quite handy. Let's it relax nice and slowly. Right, now we just gotta wait for the temper. After the temper, then we'll go to the grinding. So as is, it's still full thickness, basically. There's a little bit of taper from the forging, but we go straight from the temper over to the grinding machine and grind the bevels in, or at least roughly grind the bevels in. And then I finish the bevels pretty much all by hand. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just not a very good grinder or in my personal opinion, I think, I mean, I at least can't make the best knife I can by taking it straight from the grinder. I find there always needs to be some work on the bit right by the edge just to get it as thin as you can and just the right convexity. I mean, essentially, I think the main thing that gets me is the edge of the platen. Somewhere on my knife, once we finish grinding, there's gonna be a little bite where I've come in just slightly sideways somewhere and there's gonna be two deeper scratches somewhere in the middle of the bevel and it just always is. I've ground literally hundreds and hundreds, I mean over a thousand knives and still little dips in the bevel, just fix it by hand. I'll keep trying to learn to grind better but I don't think I'm ever gonna to get to the point where I can make it as good off the grinder as I can just by hand. I, I don't think that's a thing. So the oven has cooled back down now and I've set it up to 200 degrees centigrade. I'm just gonna put this in and that goes in there for two cycles of three hours. I'll do the first one at 200 centigrade to actually set the hardness of the temper. And then the second cycle I actually do at 180 centigrade because it's not about reducing the hardness anymore. It's more about helping some of the austenite, which is the soft phase of the steel, to convert into martensite. When you temper a knife, even though it comes out softer than you put it in, you end up with more martensite, which is the hard stuff. It's softer, but it's almost a higher quality of hardness, in a way. So we'll leave that for about three hours now, so uh, probably get back with you tomorrow. <laughs>
Hi everyone, we have a certain few people that we have to thank for day one series of Harry Goff. We have multi-tool products who do the 84 engineering belt grinders, Clark knives who do the professional heat treatment services for you guys, and they also do ready to grind Damascus billets. And we have one other set of guys to thank, and that is GFS Knife Supplies. Dave and his small family-run business team picks and packs your knife making supplies just for you. They have super quick deliveries and they ship worldwide. If you are a knife maker, then you will likely need a one-stop shop for all your knife making supplies. They do the sanding belt, they do the steel stock, they do the quenching oils, they do the heat kilns, and they even do all the handle materials that you need for your workshop. All the links are in the description. Don't forget to check out their website, gfsknifesupplies.com. I hope you enjoyed the Harry series so far because don't forget this is just day one so we've got day two coming. Don't forget to give us some love, hit that thumbs up button and we will be seeing you on the next series of videos.